So a very warm welcome uh, to uh, everybody on the call for the CAPCO Operational Resilience uh, webinar. Um, my name is Owen Jelf. I'm the uh, global head of uh, CAPCO's uh, capital markets practice. Um, and clearly, at the current time, um, with, with COVID-19 and uh, the associated challenges, operational resilience is uh, very, very much in focus. So, as I said, very well, warm welcome to everyone, and thank you for spending the time. Um, what, so, we look forward to an interesting discussion, and uh, in a moment, I'll introduce the panel. Um, we'll kick off with a short definition of uh, our view of the challenges and the features uh, um, of operational resilience. Um, we'll uh, facilitate a panel discussion, allow time for some uh, Q&A, and then we'll close. And we'll take, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, the full hour um, to do that. So um, let me quickly introduce the uh, panel on the next uh, slide. So um, these four individuals will uh, um, be debating uh, the subject. It will be moderated by um, Tej Patel, who leads our finance risk and compliance practice based in London. Um, Will Packard, who is our operational resilience head um, from Capco, will kick off with the um, the overview uh, and then obviously provide his uh, pers perspectives. Um, I'm delighted to welcome um, Emmanuel Lemora, who is uh, an associate director um, within AFMI, uh, focusing on this particular uh, issue, um, as well as Gerhard Wheeler, um, who is a uh, retired brigadier uh, from the uh, uh, from the army, um, who is very focused on uh, this subject and the logistical challenges um, around that. So, I guess without further ado, please let me hand over to Will, who will take us through um, his initial views around uh, operational resilience. Operational resilience talks to and it is about how firms respond to events and manage the resulting disruption so as to kind of minimize harm to clients or the or any impact on the uh, the functioning of the markets and, and the viability of the firm. It's not just about business continuity planning, much more end to end holistic view of a firm, its customers and the market in general. Right. So. I think if it's it's about looking at events uh, and how how would you cope with them? Uh, I think we take a very current and life uh, real life example of COVID. I wouldn't necessarily say it's something that would have been in the regulator's mind at the point, but it's a question we'll debate with the group um, later on. But the whole point is to look at the PRA and FCA's regulation that will come out, looking at it from a market perspective, but also the customer perspective. So it's it's about really doing what's needed to protect customers and the market, right? So without further ado, I'm going to move us into the panel. And these materials will be shared afterwards. So if there are any questions or if you want to read a bit more, please feel free to reach out to any of us on here. But before we go into the panel conversation, so I've got some questions together where we'll take uh, take the panelists through and get their views and, and, and input in, into it. It's based on conversations we've had with clients and colleagues on this topic. We've got a couple of supporting slides because I have been kind enough to share a couple of the questions with the yeah. panel so they have a bit of a preview. But um, in the meantime, please feel free to send through your questions via the Q&A function and I'll try and get through as many of those at the end when we have Q&A. And, and if for any reason we run out of time and can't, I'll make sure we come back to you uh, individually with responses to any questions that have been posed. So before I do get into the first set of questions, we had a couple of pre-registration questions, um, which it will be good if we kind of take a, take a pulse check on, right? So the first question we asked was, what is the biggest single cause of service disruptions? Options were external factors, capacity management, process control failure, human error, hardware issue, cyber attack, software application issue, third party failure, change management or pandemic. So for those of you dialed in who don't unfortunately have the ability to see the results, the top three in reverse order were external factors at number three. Pandemic interestingly came in at number two and a clear winner um, by some margin was process and control failure. So look, to get this uh, 
up and going as a conversation with our panelists. Why don't I start with the first question? So why are regulators taking such an interest in operational resilience? Emmanuel, if I can ask you to, to go first, please. Thanks, Ted. These are really interesting results um, and interesting to see process control failure coming out as number one. So, I mean, you know, regulators have always had a keen interest on the resiliency of the financial sector. Uh, the financial sector is often considered a national critical infrastructure and therefore regulated to uphold a certain standard of operation. In some respect, the wave of regulation that came out of the 2008 global financial crisis made sure banks came out more robust and financially resilient, and they are today. But uh, indeed, when you look at some of the results in the survey and when you look at the horizon, the risk landscape firms are facing today seems a little bit different. Risks are dynamic and evolving quickly, like cyber threats, technology disruption, or third-party risks. So what the UK regulators are saying is that even with well-capitalized firms, a major cyber attack, for example, could render your whole operations and technology ideal. And this for me is the key point in the UK's approach. It takes stock that no matter best preparations or intentions, disruption will happen. Therefore, how are firms planning for the unthinkable and ensuring an orderly management of disruption? This places a new lens on the approach where firms are asked to think about the impact of disruption on customers, other firms and the market, and how firms can minimize this impact. Excellent. Thanks for that, Emmanuel. In the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next question. So, Emmanuel, thank you for that. To follow up on that, is the approach of the FCA and PRA identical? I know appreciate it's a bit of a leading question, but it'd be good to kind of get your views on this, please. No, thank you. And I think that's a great question. I mean, what we can say is that overall, the FCA and the PRA's approach is very much aligned. Both authorities have released their consultation papers at the same time, alongside that of the Bank of England. And these publications were supplemented by a joint policy statement, a, a letter basically, that was co-signed by all three authorities, where the ask is broadly the same. So identify your important business services, set impact tolerances for those important business services, map the people, the processes, and the technology that support their delivery, and finally, take appropriate actions like scenario testing to remain within tolerances. However, when we look at the detail of the PRA and FCA consultation, uh, we can see that they are not fully identical. This is because the FCA and the PRA have actually different mandates or statutory objectives. The FCA has four objectives in its mandate, protecting consumers, protecting markets and their integrity, and prom promoting effective competition. The PRA's objective is to promote the safety and soundness of the firms it regulates. So when we look at the consultations, we see that the PRA has published a separate consultation on outsourcing, and the way impact tolerances is approached is not identical. So the PRA places a focus on the point at which disruption could cause systemic risk or system-wide issues whereas the FCA places more an emphasis on the point at which disruption goes from consumer inconvenience to consumer harm. So this could make it complicated for firms that are regulated by both the PRA and FCA and would have to manage two different impact tolerances with those authorities. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. That's a really good insight into what's different yet complementary. Um, so that's been an interesting view from, from an industry perspective. What I'd like to do is kind of change tact a little bit and bring in a military view, right? And it, it's it, if we think about the armed forces, right, their leaders when it comes to preparing and responding to fast-moving events, if we look at just about the past 12 months alone, they've supported flood relief, built NHS night again hospitals, continue to provide critical logistical support to the NHS, Gerhard, would you mind sharing what's the secret of the of this kind of successful approach the military military um, uses? Yeah, thanks. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. The um, I, I suppose the of course the armed forces are optimised to respond to crisis situations. Training, equipment, and doctrine are designed to allow them to operate successfully in high risk, disruptive, and fast changing environments. I suppose the secret to their approach is their ability to learn and adapt at pace 
to novel and volatile events. Um, to do this, they used battle-proven conceptual models like the OODA loop, which was first developed um, to improve the performance of fighter pilots in dogfights. I explain that the acronym OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Guide and Act. In simple terms, it stimulates the decision-making process of an organization in a rapidly evolving situation. The organization observes changes in, in its environment, orients or orientates fonts, facing the changes in context, and then decides on a course of action, finally acts. In the observed phase, the organization detects warning indicators of new threats. So, for example, a, a military force might pick up a social media report that a car bomb has gone off in the city center. Key to the observed phase is not only the ability to pick up new signals, but also to verify them. So perhaps the social media posts about the bomb could be verified by a traffic camera. Even more important to verification is the ability to pick up weak signals against the noisy background. So using our illustration, um, you might a patrol might have spotted a parked car in a, an unusual place before it blew up. So given an early indication, picking up that weak signal. So that's the observe phase. Next comes the orient phase or orientation. This is where the warnings and indicators are analyzed and put into context. First step of this is really to triage the information received. If a new event like a car bomb could affect others, then the priority is to communicate upwards, downwards and sideways before analyzing the situation. So in our bomb example, a control center would immediately tell all the units in the city so they can be alive to the threat of other, other bombs exploding. Once the triage is done, the organization makes deductions by drawing on local knowledge, planning scenarios that it's already done, using its experience and any intelligence been able to pick up through other sources. So, for example, how well does the incident fit our normal operating response? Are the streets in the area wide enough for recovery vehicles? Do we know of any other threats? What are the likely second and third order effects? Or do we need to reroute traffic in the city? The organization then confirms what resources are available. For example, do we have enough ambulances on standby? Do we need helicopters? But all, once all that the process is done and it's understood the situation in the Orient phase, comes the decide phase. This third phase, in some situations, will just result in just one course of action, like evacuate a building. In others, they'll need to develop alternative courses of action, like do we send a large force in to cordon the area and retrieve a vehicle and get people out, or just a small force that can focus in just on getting casualties out. If you look at those courses, Courses of action, weighs the pros and cons of each one, and then make a decision. Finally, the final act is 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 act. This is where a, a decision is turned into a plan and implemented. The results of the plan, lessons learned, are then fed into the initial observed phase, and the loop starts again. Starting the, the process again is critical because the situation would have changed. Key to the approach really is to cycle through that loop, the UDA loop, faster and faster until you are able to regain the initiative. You are in control of events rather than the events being in control of you. I don't think UDA works very well for long term activities like procurement programs because it encourages managers to keep changing requirements and assumptions, but it's ideal for crisis management. Thank you. That's very interesting um, to see, as you said, in a, such a fast paced, rapid environment, how, how the military kind of responds to that. OK, there was a second registration question. Um, so we'll kind of look at that. The question posed was, what do you think COVID-19 would have fallen into the definition of severe but plausible beforehand? Now, the yeses have a resounding three quarters with over over three quarters of the vote with 78% and no at 22%. So our audience clearly has a strong view on this. But Emmanuel Will, can I ask you, both the PRA and FCA have a requirement around a severe and plausible event. But what do you think they had in mind as COVID-19 wasn't on the radar back then? So Emmanuel, if I can ask you to, to respond first, please. Thank you, Tej. Yeah, I think this is a very important, important point. I mean, the type of event the FCA and PRA were probably considering 
in the category severe but plausible at the type uh, are the type of disruptions we've seen the past couple of years. Things like cyber attacks, which by no means are an easy risk to manage if you think of a non Petier WannaCry. Um, technology failures like the ones that happen at TSB and RBS, and an increase in the number of failures due to third party suppliers. So these are the main type of findings that are reported in the FCA's 2019 business plan. The key difference, however, with COVID-19 is that the current event should probably be classified as an extreme scenario rather than a severe scenario. And this is because pandemic plans were rehearsed by the industry before, but not to the scale and duration that we've seen so far. COVID-19 is by all means a global event, Every jurisdiction is impacted. Firms have had to implement massive working from home strategies at relatively short notice when some firms are reporting between 90 to 100 percent of staff working from home. And against this backdrop, the market has seen historical volumes of activity due to high levels of volatility. So firms have, in effect, had to do more with less. And at this point in time, uh, we can't say COVID is over. So I just at this point to emphasize that the industry has done a tremendous job in keeping markets open. And this is a testament to the capabilities firms have implemented over the years, which demonstrate a robust degree of resiliency built in firms. Yes, Will, thanks. Yes, we can. So would you like to go after that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think I've got kind of two, two uh, points to, uh, to make on this one. I think the first one is that I, I cannot imagine that sitting back in December, anyone was really expecting somewhere between a quarter and a half of the world's population to be locked down three months later. So I would be amazed if, if this is what the regulators had uh, had in mind uh, when they were drafting their consultation papers. Um, and it, it's also quite interesting. If you look at the PRA's paper, um, they talk about the uh, scenario testing. And you know, quite rightly, they, can't ex they don't expect firms to be able to cope with absolutely everything from a kind of a minor technical outage to a, to a you know a significant state on state attack um, in, a, in a major financial center, so that they they accept that firms should test scenarios and that they necessarily won't pass all those scenarios. Um, what they want is to see a, you know a clear thought process in terms of a, a, an approach in terms of how they actually come up with the scenarios, what those scenarios are, and the kind of and graduate it to see when the firm goes from being able to cope and be uh, maintain its services without breaching its impact tolerances to the point where uh, you know effectively it, it just it just can't cope. Um, and I think you know firms have actually coped well with COVID-19, uh, but part of this is because in generally they had somewhere in the order of six weeks to prepare for for the um, for for their, for their actions, um, and you saw quite a lot of um, at uh, various, you know, in early March, firms, there was kind of a range of responses that firms were uh, were, were adopting, um, remote location, et cetera. And largely they've uh, they've moved now, or they moved very quickly to get everyone as, as far as possible working from home. And then, what, you know, typically one major site where they're actually, um, you know, controlling access and really minimizing the number of people who have to be there. And for those people who have to be there, minimizing the amount of contact they have. Okay, thanks for that, Will. <clears throat> I think, Gerhard, if I may, can, what would the military view as a severe and plausible event, right? Because the, the military would do a lot of planning. What, what, would, what would fall into that category from, from a military perspective? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, I, I suppose someone like me is used to doing disaster planning. I, I can think of plenty of scenarios that are severe and plausible. But it would be impossible, I suppose, for a financial services company to plan to cope with by itself. Um, you know, a major cyber attack like, like we saw almost happened a few months ago against the NHS, um, which would completely um, make it impossible for the NHS to operate properly. Um, a nerve agent attack like we saw the, the scripple poisoning in Salisbury, where you know <laughs> the nerve agent was. What was left of it was left in a in a perfume bottle, which could have um, gone into the, the water supply and killed thousands. Um, a, a terrorist dirty bomb on a, on a container ship. Um, I think all these things would be very difficult for a, for a private company to be able to deal with that type of event with, with, without major state support. 
So as somebody who comes from outside, I, I look at the, the word severe and plausible and say, surely plausible not only, not only means um, reasonable that it might happen, but also reasonable that, that a company is able to put mitigating action in, in place. Um, so, you know, to me, severe and plausible for, for a financial service company would be some of the things you discussed earlier, which is power cuts, cyber attacks, things like that, or, or, a, or a local issue like a Legionnaire's disease, N not dealing with something in which the, the, the whole of the state has to get involved in in order to, to do, to, to make sure that it, it can still operate. Apart from obviously being able to do it, whatever actions it, it can do with, with state support. Does that help? Yeah, that's very, very insightful. Thank you. I mean, just to, just to add, you know, my start point would be to look at what local resilience forums or the National Resilience Forum have on the risk register and, and then work out what, what it would be reasonable for you to be able to, be able to do or, or what a regulator would say would be reasonable. Yeah, no, that, that, that's that's interesting uh, viewpoint. So appreciate that. Thank you. So before I go to the next question, we're going to have uh, an interactive poll. Right. So for those of you online, You'll see appear uh, highlighted in the blue on the right hand side menu above the Q&A icon. The question for, for those of you online to, to respond to is, are the regulators going to adjust their approach in light of COVID-19? Please choose from yes or no and then submit your answer. As you can see, the poll is now live. That will hopefully appear on everyone's screens that are online. So whilst the uh, audience are responding to the poll, can I ask uh, Emmanuel and Will, do you think COVID-19 is going to modify the regulators' approach from what they had published in the consultation papers in December of 19? Thank you, Ted. I think this is a great question. Uh, you know, I think the UK authorities and, and regulators around the world, and, and firms for that matter, are actively looking at COVID-19 for lessons learned as an opportunity to understand the challenges the industry is facing and how firms are responding in basically a real life situation. And what we've seen so far is that the UK authorities have revised their deadline for consultation to October 1st. So this gives the industry an additional six months to reply and consider uh, considerations around operational resilience. We're expecting as well a statement soon to push out the implementation date by six months as well to end of 2021. And this is likely because authorities are aware of the current priorities and focus of firms, but it may might be as well because they're keen to gather more insights on how firms have approached operational resiliency in the current environment. So with that being said, I don't think we'll see a significant change in the framework proposed by the PRA and FCA. We might see some very interesting feedback based on industry lessons learned from COVID, but at the same time, the framework proposed by the UK on operational resilience is agnostic to the type of disruption. It's, as Will was saying, it's an overarching approach defined around specific expectations. Do you know your important business services? Do you know your and your customers' tolerance to disruption? Do you understand what dependencies there are for their delivery? And are you actively testing, preparing, and learning for this? So I think it's still early days to fully grasp the lessons learned at the industry level um, on COVID. But further down the track, there might be some interesting insights and uh, some additional light on those key questions. So to conclude, I don't think the UK authorities will revise their approach on operational resilience based on the way regulators have framed the conversation. But if anything, I think COVID has probably placed an even more greater importance on the discussion than it had before. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's Emmanuel. I think you're absolutely spot on um, with that. Um, and I, you know, as you say, the um, but operational resilience. The whole point of it is it is is the approach is agnostic. And if you have to adjust, you know, it materially for each different event, then it's it's not it's not fit for purpose. And I actually think that the um, the approach a regulator is taking are taking is, is is reasonably sensible. I think one aspect though, which I think will be come into focus of second order effects. So now I mentioned um, a minute ago that firms have largely coped well with uh, with COVID-19 um, in terms of kind of like the, the primary effect, getting people working from home um, and so on and so forth. I think what stretched them more was the increase in trade volume and transaction volume due to the increased volatility in the market. Um, 
around kind of mid-March time that put a lot of strain on firms. And while I haven't heard of any that have kind of fallen over, I know that um, firms had people working weekends, working kind of like like 24-hour operations when typically they were kind of like a 10-hour operation to cope. Um, and I think it's a kind of second order effect that hasn't really been addressed in the, uh, with, with the, um, within the consultation papers uh, or not even really mentioned at all. But I think that, 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 that they will, regulators will focus on that because there's a little point having your staff um, being able to kind of like work off site and then the, the, you know, the, the uh, increase in volumes and uh, actually then causes your, your systems to fail, not because of the, uh, the actual disruption, but because the impact of that disruption on the markets. Thanks, Will, Emmanuel. It's, it's interesting. Um, I think like the, uh, the listeners agree as well with 90% also thinking there will be an adjustment, which to, to what you've both said is, is the framework very much is designed to deal with such an event and how do you then learn the lessons that will come as a result of what, what once we've passed the, the worst of COVID-19. So that's that's very interesting. Um, so thank you for that. If I may, um, Gerhard, if I ask uh, a question of you now. So from a military perspective, how would you learn the lessons from such a wide impacting event so that you're better prepared for that next crisis? Thanks. Um... I think it's important to understand the military is very different from commercial organizations in, in that whereas a commercial organization spends most of its time operating and uh, some of its time um, learning and training, um, the military is, is completely opposite. It, we spend all of our, nearly all of our time training and, and occasionally operate. Um, and so for us, learning lessons is a really important process and, and it's a it's a formal and deliberate process that go, goes on all of the time. Um, I suppose if I could really sum it up, the sequence we follow is to collect, analyze, implement, and audit. Um, so the, the first stage is to um, collect the lessons, and we do this in a number of ways. Leaders will write post-operation reports highlighting lessons, like you know, never invade Russia. <laughs> um, we we also Send out um, specialist lessons learned teams that investigate what happened and what lessons can be drawn from, from incidents. And, and all our operational and staff teams participate in after action reviews. These are structured group debrief sessions where members of a team are encouraged to highlight successes and mistakes of an operation or a project. Um, these these are reviews, I find they're most effective if all members of the team feel safe, not only to admit to their own mistakes, but also to openly criticize their manager's actions. You can imagine it's not easy in a military context, but, but with material leadership can be done and allows the organization to learn at a faster pace if, if everyone can be criticized. Once we've collected the lessons, the next stage really is the analysis phase. Lessons, like I'm sure most organizations are sorted into types such as technical, doctrinal process or cultural lessons, and then prioritized anything that as a safety issue will be, will be um, dealt with straight away. I think the important thing to understand here is that we talk about lessons identified at this point and not learned, because quite often we find that people talk about lesson learning and the organization hasn't learned the lesson, simply identified the lesson. Um, complex or contentious lessons were reviewed by subject matter experts and then validated through exercise and approved at appropriate level. Third stage is implementation. We, we, we have central knowledge exchange databases where lessons are recorded. We have learning programs to teach new lessons and then transformation programs for major lessons. And I think the final really important stage is the audit phase where lessons teams check that the lesson has been learned and not just identified and ignored. And that's all I've got. No, thank you for that. It's uh, very, very insightful on there. So before I go to the kind of almost ask the same question to Emmanuel and, and Will, um, I think it's quite a good point for us to almost look at what have the regulators set outside. So on the screen, for those of you on the webinar, we'll, we'll see it's a view of the steps the regulators are expecting firms to take, which have been out, outlined in their respective consultation papers and, and various publications, right? This, this is broken down into three key themes. One, understanding the process. Two, addressing vulnerabilities. And three, assessing effectiveness. So it echoes to a lot of what uh, Gerhard was talking about earlier in terms of understand, 
assess uh, uh, and then look at the effectiveness, right? Address it and, 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 and move on from that. So for my question for Emmanuel and Will, in terms of identifying and applying the lessons learned, why is this such an important part of the approach? Yeah, thank you, Tess. And I think it's really interesting to hear from Gerard the point of view from the military. I, I think there are parallels to be to be drawn, but obviously we're talking about two different sectors um, and, and commercial enterprises and businesses that are just, you know, keep operating in production mode and have to basically find ways to integrate lessons learned as they uh, are working in production. But, but you know, I just want to say that um, there's a particular importance in applying lessons learned and continuous improvement in the framework the UK authorities are proposing. And, and this is because they want firms to integrate the fact that the risk landscape is evolving and is dynamic. There will potentially never be an end game to resiliency. Rather, it will be expected of firms to continuously mature and evolve their posture and their capabilities to be prepared for disruption and any kind of disruption that could come in different forms like COVID, you know, climate change or, or others. So in essence, the UK authorities are expecting that firms continuously prepare for disruption. And a way to achieve this is to proactively learn, looking at near misses, what other market actors have done right or wrong, and integrate those in their approach. So activities like scenario testing or simulations can potentially be very powerful tools to prepare firms for when things might go wrong. And Emmanuel, I, I'd, I'd go beyond, I think I'd go further. I said that, you know, operational resilience is, is never done. I mean, and that's the, the kind of it's the whole uh, be prepared motto is that um, you know, the, the, the situation is dynamic. We, we live in a dynamic world. The threat evolves. Um, the nature of events was, um, was, uh, you know, develops as well. And um, you need to have this kind of approach that is constantly asking, so what, what if? Um, and how would we cope um, and, and really kind of challenging. Um, and I think the, uh, the regulators are absolutely um, you know, spot on here by actually saying that, in fact, every single year, every single regulated legal entity board has to sign off to say that they are operationally resilient. Um, and that will then force them under the kind of the whole SMCR reasonable steps. Um, it will force them to, to really take resilience seriously and you know, look across not just in financial services but in other organisations as well um, to, uh, to to make sure that those lessons are applied. I mean, one example from earlier this year, when it seems like a, a different age, when Travelex had to, were hit by that ransomware attack in January, um, in the kind of back end. I think actually maybe in 31st of December, but effectively the uh, they were off the air into uh, the first week of January, um, and they were hit by some ransomware, a nice bit of malware called WannaCry. Exactly the same software had been used to attack various NHS trusts in May 2017. And the question for senior managers responsible is, did you learn the lessons? Did you look across? Can you demonstrate reasonable steps that you, you looked outside right across the environment, picked up things that potentially you know, could have happened to you, looked then in more detail as to say, can this actually impact us? And then say, okay, yes, well, let, let's run a scenario test against that and see how we would cope. Um, and that's why it's, uh, you know, the whole learning the lessons. And I very much like Gerhard's decomposition of into identifying and then applying the lessons. Um, because learning the lessons is such a kind of a bit of a buzzword and you kind of hear it all the time. But actually, it's the kind of a rigorous application of like, the identification and the, uh, and the application process that actually is going to improve firms' resilience. And, and just to kind of follow on from that, what, what do you think is going to be the most challenging aspect for firms in terms of complying with the regulations once they are published and why? So, Emmanuel, if I can address that to you first, please. Thank you, Tej. I mean, I mean, I think this is an important point, and, and there are a few uh, thoughts to consider from my perspective. So one area we're particularly concerned about from a policy perspective at uh, AFMI and in discussion through our global trade affiliate, the Global Financial Markets Association, is that there's a real risk of fragmentation. And this is because we're seeing various jurisdictions who are now looking more at operational resilience as the next big thing, but are defining and approaching it in very different ways. This could potentially be a nightmare for firms with operations around the world and speaking to those regulators who have different expectations on operational resiliency. So 
to emphasize the point here is, you know, we believe operational resiliency should be a global objective for the financial sector, and it should be coordinated globally to achieve this outcome consistently in different regions. Another area of challenge, which is more specific to the framework proposed, is that there are still a few open questions where clarity is needed for firms to fully implement. And this is largely because the UK authorities are proposing an approach and want to foster a dialogue rather than you know, provide prescriptive detailed guidance in implementation. But it does leave some gray areas, such as you know, what is the appropriate level of granularity expected for imports and business services and their mapping? Or as we discussed earlier, you know, fully articulating the concept of impact tolerances requires some thinking in terms of you know, even subjective measures like you know, what is consumer harm or when does inconvenience become harm at a consumer level? So you know, one final point I think is another area uh, that I think is quite challenging is how to effectively manage third party risks. And especially when those players are potentially unregulated, you know, are a potential concern at a systemic level. And you know, it's, we can't expect firms to solve these on their own. Um, you know, there needs to be a global discussion to understand what's the appropriate course of action as a collective, if, if any. And I, yeah, Emmanuel, I, I think again, you're, 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 you're spot on with that. I, I think looking at the, um, uh, one particular point you touched on that I'd like to focus um, on is the, uh, is the granularity and the, the level for impact tolerances. Um, particularly, the regulators have said that the, um, the impact tolerance should be set at the point at which the customer finds the disruption to the uh, service intolerable, which is, you know, that's quite a, that's quite a strong statement. Um, and, and, the, and the problem that firms have is that the, the customer base isn't a homogenous group of people who are all going to say, yes, that's right, we are, that is the point at which we find the, uh, the disruption intolerable. You know, it's made up of even within the same service that the firm is offering, there's going to be a range of, uh, of, of customers that use that service, potentially use that service in a slightly different way, um, and certainly will have their own views on what is, uh, what is tolerable and what is not. And it's about gathering that information in. Now, I know there are various trade bodies working on it, um, but again, going back to the kind of SMCR reasonable steps um, approach is, you know, the firms have to really gather that and go out and capture that information, whether it by, be by, you know, survey, talking to SMEs, focus groups, all kinds of, um, you know, and I'm really talking particularly for the larger firms here, but they, they really need to kind of go and fight for that information and, uh, and, and get a really, you know, test out what, propose, what they propose in terms of their impact tolerances on their customer base. Because otherwise, you know, if you're just sitting in isolation um, in some kind of ivory tower and canary wharf, trying to work out what your impact tolerance, what an impact tolerance is on, on your customer, um, you're not really, you don't maybe have the best perspective on that. Um, so I, I think firm, that's, that's going to be the most challenging part for firms, particularly as once that impact tolerance has been set and agreed, more or less all the activity after that just falls out, falls out of it. So in terms of the, uh, the amount of work required to make the process to deliver that service resilient, um, the testing that's then done on it, um, it, 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 everything follows on really from that impact tolerance. Thank you, Will and Emmanuel, for that. Mm. Will, you mentioned something around the senior manager regime. Do you, can you, do, yes. do you want to elaborate a little bit on the kind of impact on operational resilience? And I'll kind of, uh, Emmanuel, ask to get your views after that, please. Yeah. So, senior manager certification regime um, is kind of the UK's individual accountability regime that came in for banks um, about three years ago, and then for you know insurers and asset managers last Christmas or at the end of last year, um, it says explicitly which person within an organization has responsibility for operational resilience, um, which is the SMF24, which is the kind of COO slash CIO function. Um, and then it also says that the board um, has to sign off, which then triggers the kind of CEO and the various other directors and executive and non-executive on the board. So, they, they, as I mentioned, have to demonstrate reasonable steps in terms of their, um, their approach to supervision and their approach to uh, you know, running the firm and managing and fulfilling their duties in that, um, which in terms of operational resilience means that they've got to make sure that A, the steps have been followed and that 
they can demonstrate clearly that they've taken reasonable steps in doing that. Um, and reasonable steps is a relatively high bar, partic- you know, in, and you know, in one aspect because it's it's not set. You know, one person's reasonable steps may be different to another's. Um, and when we're looking at, with hindsight, um, you may end up with a third with a third view. So it, it's it's kind of a relatively hard. It's a relatively high bar. Um, but you know, the end result is going to be that firms management are much more focused on operational resilience than they've been on, say, BCP uh, in the past. And it's not just going to be something that's kind of farmed out that businesses and led by operations that the businesses actually undertake. It's something that is much more core to the actual running of the firm. Um, and I think that will that will have it will have various knock on changes in the way that firms are managed. Yeah, well, I, I fully agree with you on that. And, and just to complement uh, your point, I think, you know, from a policy perspective, uh, w- what we can see is that the UK wants a clear ownership and accountability of operational resilience within the firm. And, and this leads to some of the impacts you're seeing, which is, you know, potentially enforceable actions from a conduct perspective further down the track. So, you know, again, as you were mentioning, I think the framework the UK authorities is, propo- is proposing is designed to be holistic in nature. What authorities want to see a clear line going you know, top down from the organization where the board and senior management have responsibility of this topic in the firm and are driving actionable decisions in the business lines to achieve specific client facing outcomes. So you know, ultimately the view is that the res- resiliency can drive good business outcomes for the firm and its customers and it should therefore be discussed at that you know, strategic top level to drive adequate investments and decision to support that desired outcome. Excellent, thank you both for that. Now, look, I, I see there's quite a few questions that have been uh, posted, so we've got five. I, I, I'll try my best to get through all of them. So, um, not in any particular order, but we've got one question that's come in, and uh, Gerhard, I'm gonna address this one to you if I may. So the question is, is OODA loop a recommended approach during any crisis or are there other similar approaches like that? Yeah, thanks. Um, it, it, it's a basic conceptual model that's used by the UK military, but, but there, there are other models um, and s- some of them are designed specifically in military, some for emergency services. There, there are, the military also uses uh, concepts like mission analysis and there's a, there's a set question model. So, so lots of models. I mean, to be honest, UDA is just a very simple framework which, which, you, which, you can, which you can build on in different ways de- depending on what your organization is. So, so yeah, there are other ways of, th- of thinking about it, but, but uh, we, we've used UDA for years because it, because it works. Okay. That, that's good. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that answers the, uh, the question from the person that posted. So, Emmanuel, there's one actually directed to you here. Makes it nice and easy to see who to, to give this one to. So it says, given the PRA focus on disruption and outsourcing, have you seen additional guidance questions from the PRA as a result of the pandemic on firms offshoring presence and an ability to bring back functions onshore? Are you expecting they will do so if they have not yet done so? Thank you. I think that's a very uh, good question. So, so thank you for, um, for the person who's asked that question. Um, so what we've certainly seen, we've not seen specific statements uh, from the PRA or FCA or any other regulators for that matter, actually, on um, you know, supply chains and what that meant in terms of potential disruption. But we have you know, uh, been in close contact with our peers in US and Asia to understand how uh, certain countries that may go in a, in a rapid lockdown like India you know, what kind of implications that would have for some of the operations based there. And, you know, some of our colleagues have worked um, you know, around the clock to make sure that some of the essential workers were sort of able to access a uh, premise if they needed to complete certain activities on site. So I think what this basically says is, you know, firms are going to have a much better grasp and understanding of their supply chain uh, due to COVID. And this might go, you know, from some of their suppliers that may have uh, been disrupted or certain countries where, some issues have uh, have happened, and I, I don't think for now we have a clear view from the regulators in terms of that. But I think we can certainly expect that they will expect firms to have done the homework on the back of those findings and made uh, adjustments uh, where needed. 
Thank you for that. Actually, you know what? A new one has just popped up. And Will, with your military background and now leading operational resilience for us, how best can executives pick up the military approach to dealing with a crisis? Um, I think there are two sides to, to, to this. Um, and you know, thank you to whoever uh, put in the question. Um, one is through training. Organizations typically are very flat structures, um, partly for cost reasons, partly because it's a good way of getting ideas up quickly um, without too many layers of filtering management. Um, but what they're, uh, they're bad at is rapid change and enacting rapid um, decisions, which are the sort of things that you know, an operational resilience event requires if it's going to be responded to effectively. So firms need to be able to pivot from a kind of a flat management structure to a much more kind of vertical command and control structure very, very quickly. And that's only possible um, through training. Um, and that training is both kind of conceptual. This is, this is actually how firms should actually, uh, this, is, this is how we need to organize ourselves to be able to cope in a crisis. Um, it involves, you know, as, as I see it, I'm going to put a kind of slightly capco hat on here, um, you know, applying the military approach, but also looking at the kind of behavioral science behind um, the uh, operational resilience and or behind decision making under pressure and decision making crisis scenarios. And then the last part is practice. So rehearsing. And it's that practice, 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 which is how, you know, that's one thing the military do. They rehearse, they go on exercise. And it's something that firms need to do. You cannot expect to you know, wake up with a crisis and uh, suddenly be able to uh, expect managers who just haven't been trained and haven't been experienced to be able to cope with it. Um, although one thing that's kind of occurred to me is um, you've probably all hold, heard the, uh, the old saw about um, if you ask people that you're an above average driver, 95% of people say they're an above average driver. I would suggest the same thing holds, through to manage, holds true for managers. If you ask a manager, are you a good, are you a good at managing in a crisis? I think most of them would say, yeah, I'm, a, I'm definitely above average at uh, managing in a crisis. Um, now, obviously, that, that can't be true. Neither of those can be true. Uh, and I think it's like anything else. If you haven't trained and you haven't practiced for something, you're not going to be very good at it. OK, thank you. That, that's sound advice. I, Emmanuel, there's, there's a second question on here which does follow up from the one you, you answered just previously around um, kind of location. It, I'll read the whole question out, but I think there's the kind of back part of it that you probably need to answer. So operational resilience has focused on location strategies, disaster location, follow the sun support, technology hubs, etc. With companies now seeing working from home as a real viable solution, do you think this will impact the location strategy? So I know you touched on that before, but the, the pertinent kind of point to this would be how do you think risks will be managed from data controls during work working from home? Yeah, I think that's a, a very interesting point. And I think some of the lessons or findings that we've found in how firms have managed coronavirus is that, you know, disaster, disaster recovery sites were not really being used uh, to respond to the crisis. And this is because, you know, of sanitary hy hygiene measures, contagion, uh, you know, needs. And I think, uh, you know, in speaking with our members, I think this has certainly uh, proven a point, which is that firms can actually operate with, uh, you know, with a significant amount of employees working from home. I mean, obviously, there's things that will have to be work around that. You know, do employees have the right uh, infrastructure at home to cope with uh, the type of work that they're doing? Are there specific regulatory provisions which require physical things to be done? So there will be changes needed. But I think on the whole, it's definitely uh, given some thinking to firms in terms of location strategy, real estate, and, you know, the future of the workforce, basically. Um, now, I think the question on risks is is a very interesting one and, and quite different in the sense that, uh, for example, when we spoke to some of our cyber uh, colleagues, uh, when, when the virus first, uh, you know, when plans were basically, uh, firms were working from home massively, there was an increase in terms of cyber attacks. And so we wanted to make sure banks were, you know, capable to, to deal with that. And basically, banks said, you know, it's, you know, broadly phishing campaigns, uh, very retail focused. Uh, so nothing major. I mean, they're obviously very engaged and, and, and top of their game. But one area that is posing challenge is uh, is the way that uh, employees manage data in a home environment with, you know, managing different things at home, their personal laptop, their work laptop. 
And you know, is this creating different risk or different ways risk should be managed? And firms have basically had to spend more time uh, on the perimeter, making sure that you know the environment in which firms operate is, is more secure and, and sort of monitoring on, on the web or the dark web if you know there's data leakages or things that could highlight issues internally. So definitely the working from home is changing the posture and the way firms are managing risk. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, well, look, with interest of time, I'm, uh, I know there's a couple more questions that we haven't managed to get through, but as I said at the top, we'll, we'll respond back to the individuals that have raised them. And if it's a question you'd like answered, please feel free to reach out um, and we'll, we'll share that response. But what I'd like to do um, before handing over for final thoughts um, or advice from, from our panelists, I'd like to thank each and every one of them so that's uh, Gerhard, Emmanuel, Will, for the time, the, the kind of insight and thought that you've provided to the audience. I know I found it thoroughly uh, fascinating and interesting, especially to getting that military view. So a big thank you um, from myself and, and, and Katko for your time on this. So if I could hand over for your final kind of thoughts or advice to, to the listeners. Gerhard, let's start with you, please. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, I just to add this idea of just circling through that OODA loop and how you improve it. I mentioned training, which I think is really important because you know people will be um, have human reactions like fear and uh, confusion, and what they don't need to do is is try and work out the process. That, that, that needs to be in their heads. Secondly, I think discipline is really important. Um, it's not just a military thing. If you watch a Formula One team, you, you're changing their t changing tyres on a. You'll see how discipline is important. Much harder in a commercial setting, and and you see it now. Just, country in when you get people to stay two meters apart and do, do what you ask them to do and so you've got to think through how you motivate them i think you need to think through leadership um in a crisis people need to leaders need to flex their leadership style from being perhaps if they're collaborative they need to be directive at times you know when, when the house is burning down it's not really the time for a focus group you know at, at that point you've got to be quite directive about what, what needs to be done um and finally, I'd say you need to you need a culture of initiative. Really, um, if if your junior managers feel that they are empowered to respond to incidents as soon as they happen, then a, a small incident won't turn into a crisis. That's all I've got. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. If I can ask for a, a quick kind of close out from yourself, please. Yes, thanks. Uh, so for me, I think the main takeaway is that uh, coronavirus uh, has shown that operational resilience is here to stay. But there are still challenges in its implementation in the UK. I think we should also recognize uh, the way firms have managed thus far an unplanned extreme situation and support the role of banks in the recovery phase. There will be a time for lessons learned and those will provide interesting insights on what good operational resilience practices have looked like. So yeah, that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much for organizing. Brilliant, Thank, thanks. Uh, will. And uh, I mean, the, the only, um, and I mean, my, my final point is that the regulators, while they've pushed the, their expected um, time for completion out to the end of uh, 2021, I think that, the, um, that there's a little bit of a misconception that the you know, firms have all got three years like they've got for normal regulation. Um, they expect, the regulators are expecting firms to, uh, you know, the larger, more, more systemically important firms to be much further ahead in terms of their operational resilience um, preparations, um, and, and so it's, it's something that is you know don't don't hang around, um, get on the case and uh, and, and, and get this done um, because you know COVID-19 is going to make uh, events I think more likely in the future rather than less, um, and you know the focus is on operational resilience at the moment, and uh, you know, firms need to, to kind of get on with making sure that they're ready. Brilliant, thanks for that, Will, uh, and again thank you all for for the panelists. Owen, if I can hand over to you for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you, Tej. And um, I mean, let me also thank uh, all the attendees for uh, uh, joining today. Um, we very much appreciate it. Um, obviously, we, we, we apologise for some of the operational resilience challenges. I guess the irony <laughs> of that, given the topic uh, earlier, and I, no doubt, Will, you'll be uh, having a few words with your provider. but. Uh, 
um, yeah, this, this is obviously an extremely topical um, subject um, and uh, one that will remain in focus at board level, frankly, uh, in uh, all, the, all the enterprises that uh, everyone is associated with and we deal with uh, day to day. So it leaves me simply just to thank our uh, panellists. I think it was an excellent discussion and uh, hopefully there were some, some useful perspectives uh, there for people to take away in their day to day. Um, as you can see on, on the, uh, the slide, we've got a, a number of other events um, coming up in uh, due course, and uh, we'd be delighted if um, um, everyone can uh, participate accordingly. So um, without further ado, thanks very much for me, and uh, we will uh, um, no doubt engage in the, uh, uh, in the course of things and uh, stay safe and uh, uh, okay given the current environment. Cheers.